you grab your Bible, open it to Luke chapter 10 and stand with us. We're going to pick up where we left off last week and talk about our thinking and talk about what God does and how God wants to bless. How many of you know God really wants to bless? Oh, how he loves you and me. Luke chapter 10, begin reading with me in verse number 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? He answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you would live. This is the track. You're tracking. Keep on it. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, you could tell he's been thinking about this, probably had many conversations uh, as an attorney. He wanted to know really what it meant. He said, who is my neighbor? Think they, well, you know, am I supposed to really love everybody? I mean, do I get a right to to say this person okay, this person not so much? Can, can, can Can I weigh it out? Do I have to really do this for everyone? Who really is my neighbor? Right? Am I my brother's keeper? Y'all, y'all hear? So Jesus answered and said, A certain man, certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two dinars and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend... When I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And He, that is the lawyer, said, he who showed mercy on him. What a powerful statement. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, we, it is obvious we love you. We praise you. We hold you in the highest of esteem. We have taken time off of our schedule to uh, come to this place where we knew that your people would meet. We did not come out of habit. We came because this is the right thing in our heart. It is our love. It is our choice. And Lord, we ask that you would meet us here. For those that are watching online, Lord, We know that they've taken time out of their schedule as well. They've had to go through some things to to find this. They had to be intentional to join us here today. So, Lord, in the same way that those that came to the building, bless those that are watching online. But, Father, I pray that for all of us, Lord, that you would just draw us to yourself. Open your arms wide. Father, may we have a a Christ encounter today. Father, make me small enough so that you can be big enough. The power is in you and you alone. But Lord, I know you and I've, I've walked with you enough to know that you are the change agent and you want to do so much more than we could even comprehend. So Father, be that with us today. Help us to think on you. Give us ears to hear. And I pray, Lord, that no spirit, no spirit, no spirit at all except the Holy Spirit will be welcomed and listened to and, Lord, uh, will be honored in this place today. And, Lord, Holy Spirit, as we seek to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the glory of God the Father, honor it with your presence and your power and your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Here is the question the attorney, when he came to Jesus, asked, 
What shall I do that I may have life? We all want that. When, when, when we are looking for eternal life, and by the way, all of, us, all of us created by God, by the same God, we're given in our spirit a desire to know him. In Genesis, it says that he placed eternity in our hearts. So when we uh, think on these things, Isaiah 118 says, come, let us reason together. We need to be thinking together about all that it is that God has for us. So when we think of this question, what should we do to be right with God, to obey God, to serve him well, then he asked the, the, the attorney, Jesus said, well, what does the word say? What does the word of God say? What is it that it says that we need to do? Well, he quickly took him to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 and said, well, the word of God says that we're supposed to love God with all of our hearts, so strength and mind. Well, okay. Then he said in Leviticus 19, 18, you're supposed to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And Jesus says, you've rightly spoken it. Do this, and you will live. This is words that were common. But words that are common can lose their significance. John 3, 16, probably the most known verse, the most quoted verse, and the most outstanding verse. But yet we know it in our heart. Sometimes even then we can lose the significance that God sent his only begotten for poor, wretched sinners like us. He gave of himself. He gave all that he had, all that he could give because he wanted so much for us. So when we think of these verses, the great Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 5, we're to love God. That means that when we think on God, we are to think of him, we are to feel of him, and we are to choose him. Our mind is built to think on the things of God. Our mind is wired to be positive, to be encouraging, to be strengthening. Our brain is built for love. It's wired for love. All of us have a desire to be loved and be secure and, and to have belonging. We're all, we're all wired for that. God wants us to have that. He made us this way. And one day he'll take us to heaven. If you choose him as your personal Savior and Lord, you can go and, and be with him in a place that he's prepared for you. And, and you will be at home in your mind, in your thoughts, with loved ones. It's going to be wonderful. We'll be with God and we'll be with others. Amen? That is the way God wants it for us. Everything about us is to be in our mind. Mind, if you want to look at this as a, as a math equation, it's this. Mind equals thinking. We all think. Which creates feelings. We all have feelings which creates choices. We all make our choices. So when we think of our heart, we are thinking about how we feel, right? You feel in your heart, right? Your soul is that life spirit that God gave you that, that, that meshes with him and with each other. With our strength, that is our passion, our will, our desire, our wants. That is our thinking, our mind, our choices. Mind equals thinking. We all think. The choices, the feelings that we that come from that, and the choices that we make based upon that. And, and it's all good until that other stuff comes in. And when that other stuff comes in, and, and we start thinking on that, when the, when the ugly stuff and, and the hurtful stuff and, and the, the, the things of this world, and by the way, they're out there. It's just like an oppression. It's just like gloom that's out there. And, and if you're not careful, you'll just follow the thinking of this world, and you'll start feeling like the world feels about it, and you'll start choosing what the world chooses about it, and that's not going to help. That's not good at all, at all. So 
What is it we're supposed to do? How is it we're supposed to do this? In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to think about it the way Jesus thinks about it. Well, what does that mean? When the ugly stuff comes into our mind, we've got to think differently than the ugly. The ugly thoughts will lead to ugly feelings and ugly choices. But if we can have positive thoughts, then it will create positive feelings and positive choices. Take your Bible and look over into Philippians. Philippians chapter number 4. I want you to hear what Paul said to the church there at Philippi. Now, by the way, uh, for me to say this and say it correctly, you need to remember Paul was the, the founding uh, pastor of the church at Philippi. He was the one who went there when there were no Christians. But hear this, they didn't treat him well. He gave them the, the love of God, but you know what they gave him? They beat that man. They whipped him. They threw him in jail. You know the story, most likely, of the Philippian jailer, and Paul witnessed to him, and he got saved. And, and after the Philippian jailer got saved, he went out, and he, uh, he uh, put ointment on his wounds. They whipped him. I mean, if you start thinking about, if someone does something negative to you, the first thing you're going to do is have, have negative feelings towards them. Are we right? Someone hurts you, you're going to remember that, and you're going to remember those negative feelings that you had, and, and you're going to, you're going to if, if, if something doesn't intervene, you're going to have very negative actions back towards them. But to this group of people, at the end of this letter, I want you to hear what Paul says. Finally, this is in Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever, I mean, it could be anything. It's not just one unique thing, but whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things, meditate on these things, let your thoughts remain there. So we've got... We don't have to, to, to say, oh, I, I need to think negatively. No, no, no. That comes naturally to us. That's just our natural reaction to, 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 to hard, difficult things that come to us that we face in life, the circumstances of life. But he says, listen, you don't have to think those thoughts. So whatever things are, are, are good, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are noble, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, let your thoughts go there. The pure thoughts, the lovely thoughts will produce different feelings which will help us make right choices. Or we can just stay with the negative thoughts which create negative feelings which create negative results. Kind of understand? So there's a the thinking, feeling, choosing. There's choices that come. Well, how do we do this? Can, can, we, say, can we all agree? Y'all listen to me. Can we all agree that when the negative thoughts and, and the temptations and the hardships come, it would be good if we could change the channel? Amen? It could be good if we could just mute the negative and turn the volume up on the positive. That all be good, right? Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, that means all of us are here on this earth in the human nature that God gave us. We're all the same. Okay? Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. That tells me this. We have a way that we look at things. You ever heard somebody say, well, I think, 
No, 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 this is, this is what you're supposed to do. Well, yeah, but what I think, that's human reaction to our human wisdom. So he says, though we, though we all are going through this in the flesh, we, don't, we, we have a different way of dealing with it than the human way of dealing with it. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not of this world, but they're mighty in God. An all-powerful, almighty God. And by the way, this is not my weapons. This is his weapons. And with his weapons comes his power. So if you pick up his weapons, you're going to shoot his bullets. With his aim. And it'll hit the spot. The Lord hadn't missed one yet. So if we want to follow his pattern in his way... We're going to find out, come on now, are you listening? It works. I don't have to come up here today and tell you, well, I have a theory that you might want to try, and I'm not too sure if it's going to work or not. I'm simply saying to you, this works if you work it, if you follow it. He says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. That's the areas where the, the enemy has built up a defense in our life. How many of y'all have been battling some of the same things for a long time? Casting down arguments. Y'all ever had an argument with yourself and lost? Amen? And you want to do the right thing, but then that, that thinking starts happening and you start wanting to weigh the options whether you want to do this or do that. These are mighty in God for casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This is the, the very essence of the working of Satan and how he pro, probes and plods and, and, and instigates and tempts and, and brings all this stuff up against us. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Taking the thought captive. When the thought comes, and it's just in its Genesis form, just the beginning of it, stop it. Grab a hold of it. In your thinking, say no to it. Whatever things are good, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things, find something praiseworthy and change the channel. Stop the negativity. Stop where it's headed. Stop the ugliness right there. Take that negative thought captive. Your mind is wired to be positive. Don't let it always go to the negative. Your brain is wired for love. Don't let it react in hate or revenge or getting back to someone or doing unto the others as they did to you. And I think that's really our interpretation of that many times. Well, you, they did that to me. They don't deserve me to do good to them. Then they'll say, preacher, you just don't know what they did to me. I was kidding with someone at, in between the first service, and they were talking about I was going to have to do something. I said, it's okay, I don't mind. I got skin like a rhinoceros. I mean, you can shoot me all you want to. Half the time, they're going to bounce off. I was talking with Daniel back there, and we were talking about paintball. and how, how they Y'all know what paintball is? How they used to shoot people with paintball? And, and until I found out that the youth knew how to freeze those things. They put them in the freezer so they came out like marbles, right? And I said, it's okay. My, I'm so hard-headed. They bounce off me. It wouldn't, wouldn't even bother me at all, right? Look, you, you, can, you can react in negativity or you can choose another way. If you take it, oh, how? come on, can we just pause and think about this? What would it be like 
If we, if we said, I don't care what the world says, I don't care what the wisdom of the world says, I don't care about that, that the world says it's okay to, to be mean and to, and to only want your own way and to treat people the way that, that you think they deserve to be treated so it really honors you. I don't care. What would it be like if we said no to all that and said, I only want to do the right thing, the positive thing, the encouraging thing, the loving thing. Do you think our day would be different? Would you like to make a difference in the world? Would you like to make a difference in your life? Let it start right here. Let it start right here. Take your Bible, look in Ephesians. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm headed towards the, the good stuff. But look what it says in Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse 29. Y'all still with me? Let no cor corrupt word. Oh, that's... Don't let, don't let one bad word, one non-positive word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for the necessary edification, the building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers do not grieve come on listen to the word of God do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God that negativity that we have grieves the Holy Spirit that is living within our lives by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Take your Bible and Luke, look in Luke chapter number 10. When I was preaching last week, I got to the first part that we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then it came to this last part, and there's a, a second part of this. That was the answer that the attorney gave, the, the Shema, the love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then he said also, Leviticus 19, 18 says, love your neighbor, treat your neighbor the way you want to be treated, the way you want to be loved. Well, Jesus said, you've answered rightly. Do this, you will live. Then he said, oh, but really, who's my neighbor? I mean, do I have to do this to everybody? You really almost kind of condescendingly, you expect me to do this to everybody? I mean, is there not a loophole in this? Uh, not saying that attorneys are looking for loopholes. But he looked at this and Jesus just gave him a story. Verse 30, a certain man. Uh, that word there in the Greek when Jesus spoke it is gender neutral. They had to, it, it would be like saying a certain person. They put it in the masculine form, but this particular word is not in the masculine. So a lot of times when we think about this, we think about a, a young, strong guy that got found by thieves, and they beat him up and left him there, but he's probably 35 and rich and got a Mercedes at the house and got, a, got a, all the great education, and he's buff. He, he goes to the gym all the time, and he's so smart. And we think about how this great guy over here, but, but look, it could be any person is really what he's talking about. When you think about this person, it could be a woman. It could be an older woman. Maybe like your mom. Or it could be like a child. It could be a 12-year-old. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Here's the point. Here's the reason why Jesus did it that way. When he's thinking about a person in need, it's not the one that you approve of. It could be any person. Any person out there whatsoever. He said, a certain man or a certain person 
went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, Jerusalem is at a high elevation. It's kind of on the top of a hill. Jericho is at the bottom of the hill. So the road from Jerusalem, as you're going down to Jericho, is a road that, have y'all ever been through the mountains? Kind of a winding road. Have y'all ever been on a road that kind of wind through the mountains and it didn't have a guardrail? I mean, you get up close and you're going, ooh, right? This may be one of those roads. And it was, a, it was a great place for an ambush. And the road was really probably, in, in that day, no more than 10, 12, 13 foot wide. So here they, you, you, you really can't get beyond seeing what's on the road. And, and while he was there, he, he sees this person. He fell among thieves. They stripped him of his clothing, wounded him. And just left him there half dead. I've always been intrigued by that word, half dead. You know, when they're half dead, they're just really more than, more than halfway there. They're, they're just on death's door. You know what I'm talking about? He's just there, just no hope. I mean, he's just he's going quick. Well, it says there in verse uh, 31, now by chance. Do y'all believe in chance? You think a sovereign God may have planned someone to come by there? You think the things that happen to you accidentally happen to you? I can promise you one thing. Before you wake up in the morning, God has already prayed for you. He's already looked at your day. And you're only going to face certain things during that day. There may be some things the enemy wants to bring against you that are harder or more difficult. But God's going to say, no, no, no. So really, you need to understand to know this. If you're facing it, God's already said, okay, because if they will follow me, it'll be all right. I don't know that y'all heard that. Let's keep going. By chance, a certain priest came down that road. Can Let's call him a preacher, a minister. Let's say this is somebody who has given his life to, to help and minister and love on other people. Maybe he wore an orange shirt and a, whatever kind of coat you call this, I don't know. Maybe he just went to the dry cleaners and got his priestly robe out, and he's, he's got all of his prayer stuff. I mean, he looks official. He looks good, right? And he's walking down the road, and when he saw him, he looks over and he sees this person I mean, whooped up on beat half to death and just laying there bleeding and hurting and moaning and crying. What does he do? He passed by on the other side. He got as far, that's what it means. He got as far away from him as he could. He looked, he knew. I mean, this is in his wheelhouse. This is why he lives. This is what he gets up to do every day. But maybe he was going on to a revival down in, down in Jericho. Maybe he thought, I don't have time for this. I mean, there's people I need to go minister to down there. Or maybe he's thinking, you know, if I call 911, maybe I've got a dead cell and I don't have good reception here. And if I do, i got to wait around and, and, and i got things to do. i got to go time for this this would be an imposition this doesn't fit into my schedule so he got as far away from that I don't know but you know sometimes I think this is a word that visually says I don't have time for that and he moves away Can, can I give a word here? Shame on him. Verse 32. Likewise, in the same way, a Levite. How many of y'all know about the Levites? I mean, do we talk about the other tribes that much? But when you talked about a Levite, this was somebody who was born into a family. And simply because he was born into that family, he thought he was somebody right? I mean, he looked down on other people because they were not like him. He was the haves. You know, there's always the haves and the have-nots. 
This is a very bitter and very a racist statement. This is somebody who thought it was beneath them to have to look at somebody else. They looked at that person and went, oh. Now, look here, verse 32. When the Levite came, he arrived at the place and he came and looked. I mean, he, he got a closer look. What is it about us that wants to be right in there on it? I mean, we're driving down the road and there's a wreck. And why is it we have to drive five miles an hour so we can look over there? If you're not careful, you'll cause a wreck watching a wreck. And, and I don't understand this. If, you're in the, if the wreck is in the northbound lane, I understand backing up traffic. But tell me why in the southbound lane it's backed up 10 miles, going five miles an hour doing this. Because, you see, there's something in us that wants to look at it and wants to know about it, but we don't have time to help people. I mean, we'll drive by somebody that's got a flat on the side of the road, and we'll say, Lord, bless them. Let me speed up a little bit here, you know. And we start thinking about that. What if it was your mom there? When I just made that statement, you wouldn't believe the looks I saw in y'all's faces. It's almost like... But, Pastor, we could never stop and help anybody anymore. The days today. At this particular place, this was a road that was known for people ambushing other people. So this person probably thought, well, I don't have time for this. Went off on his own. Once again, moved to the other side and went on. But then we come... To verse number 33, but a certain Samaritan. I, I don't know that you know this, but the, the Jews didn't think much of the Samaritans. That's, that's what makes when Jesus went and met the woman at the well, made it such a huge incident, was because they were not even to talk to the Samaritans. You know what they called the Samaritans, the Jewish people? They called them dogs. Does that offend y'all? I don't know why in the way, why in the world we feel like we have a right to look down upon other people and call them names. But we do. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, look at verse 33 now. He had compassion. He's thinking about it. And as he sees it and he's thinking about it, there's something that wells up in his feelings. In his feelings, love shows up. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds right there on the side of the road. He's now ministering to him. He takes out his, his oil and wine and he pours it on it. And he set him on his own animal. That means now he's going to have to walk. This other person is taking his place. And he brought him to an inn. Inns were not, they're, they're not on every corner like they are around here. He had to find this place, and he had a purpose for it. He took care of him. That didn't mean he just bought him a room and gave him a key and said, you're on your own, I got things to do. He ministered to him. He probably was up all night with him. Y'all know what it's like to get get called when at the inconvenient times but yet out of love you minister anyway on the next day when he departed he took out two denarii that's a day's wage times two two denarii basically he gave them to the innkeeper and he said take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. He says, I'm going to pay you for two days to take care of this person. I, I will pay you a day's wage times two. If, it's, if it takes five days or if it takes eight days, when I come back, I'll pay that. I've got to go, but I'm still going to take care of him. So Jesus asked the question. He said, which one was neighbor to him? Which one of the three? 
Look at verse 37. Here's what the attorney replied. He who showed mercy on him. Which one was neighbor to him? The one who looked at him and said, whether he deserves it or not, I'm going to love him anyway. It has nothing to do, <clears throat> oh, come on now. The word love means to see. <clears throat> the, lo the word love means to see value. And because you see value, you place yourself under it. And it is the word to cherish. To cherish. This Samaritan in this story saw someone else that a preacher and a uppity Levite, they saw no value in them. So they went their own way. But this person looked at them and said, if God loves them, I love them. And it has nothing to do with if they can do something for me. I'm going to do something for them. Aren't you grateful that God gives us grace, those things that we don't deserve and we can't pay, but God just gives abundant and amazing grace to us? But aren't you also grateful that the things that I actually do deserve, I deserve condemnation. I, how many of y'all this week, if, if the sins that you had committed this week went public, you would be so embarrassed? That was a good oh me moment, and I don't think you. But here's the point. This person looked at that person the way God did. This person valued that person the way God values that person, any person. This person put themselves under that person the way God did. When Jesus Christ came down here to the earth, humbled himself, took off the robes of glory, served us. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. To the place where he went to the cross to be condemned and killed and poured out his blood to give his life so that we could have life. So which one loved like Jesus did? Now hear this. Hear this well. You know you're gonna you know how you're gonna learn to think positively and to love and cherish God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We can't see him. But he gave us a practicum. He gave he gave us a plan. He gave us a way to learn how to love God. Loving each other. And how? Just do for them the way you would want someone to do for you. Love them the way God would love you. Mercy. See value. Cherish. Put yourself under. If the church could get this one point, it would change the lives of the individuals and move them from, from boredom and despair and anger and clamor, all those things we read about in, in Ephesians 4 that literally grieve the Holy Spirit. It would move us to the place of glorifying God where the Holy Spirit would say amen in our life and we would learn to love. If there's any virtue, if there's anything that's pure, if there's anything that's praiseworthy, anything that's just, anything of good report, anything at all. We go that way because that's where God is. And, and as we do it for each other, God builds the love in us for him. And when we get to heaven, there are going to be two groups of people there. Our Lord and those he loves. Amen? Amen? So who should we be about today? Our Lord, who we say that we love, and all those other people that we love. Would this change us? 
Would this help us? Do we need it? Are we growing? Are we just going through life just acting and reacting the way we want to and how we feel? Or are we striving to grab hold of the power of God, the change of God, the goodness of God, and be used as a change agent? I have learned before I can say yes to God, I need to say no to some other stuff first. And as I say no, it's a whole lot easier to say yes. And when I, to say that I love God really comes down to that point. Because he's going to love me whether I mess up or not. Right? The choice of Friday, I was here at the church. It was late in the day, and uh, God gave me an example of this. He knew it was on my heart, and God gave me two people to uh, love on. I had met one before. Now I got to meet the spouse. And can I say that they had nothing to offer as far as this world judges but can I also say that God blessed my socks off because I got to look at them the way God looks at them and to see a man with tears just flowing just flowing flowing and me thinking in my, my own thoughts in my own life I am so blessed. And it wasn't taken out of my time. No. And I wasn't worried about what was in my wallet or what I could do to hold on to. I was just grateful to be loved. And I tell you what, there are times that I'm a spoiled brat. When I walk past see the needs that are real on this earth and I'm not moved God help me I want to be like Jesus can I just say I'm not trying to brag but in one day I got to be like Jesus and it may it felt so good it's our choice